Exciting on a Thursday afternoon. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is the military in Hawaii. We have Noelani Kalipi and we have Greg Fleming. And we're going to talk about Pahakaloa, which is one of my favorite subjects because my heart lives on the Big Island. And I know, Noelani, that yours does too, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. How about you, Greg? Are you a Big Island person deep down? I absolutely am. I love the Big Island and uh, I've got family here with us. Uh, son and daughter-in-law and grand, grandchildren living on the island as well. So it is our home. So um, I, I get it, Greg, uh, you know, your association with Pohakaloa training camp, training, training, what is it? PT. Training area. Training area. It sounds like the Parents Teachers Association, but we're not <laughs> going to go there. <laughs> and, you know, I, I get it, but can you, can you give a short, you know, like bio of where you've been in the army, uh, I know you've been a lot of places for decades, so we're going to have to do this in like one or two minutes. Yeah, I came in, in the late 1970s, uh, joined the Army, and I spent 24 years on active duty as an engineer officer. Then I retired and I moved over to the civilian side. So I'm an Army civilian, uh, all totaled about 40 plus years of professional experience working with the Army. And right now I'm stationed and in, in supporting U.S. Army Garrison Pohakaloa here at Pohakaloa Training Area. It's in the uh, kind of the center of the island, uh, nestled between both Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. Under uh, what, uh, uh, Colonel Boris, is it? Yes, and, and I would just say on behalf of Lieutenant Colonel J.R. Boris and Command Sergeant Major Will Gray, thanks for having us. Uh, they were not able to be here today. They're uh, off island and they're uh, over at Koolave and uh, looking at uh, sites there on Koolave uh, and they're not available. Okay. Okay. And uh, Noelani, um, you, you, uh, I, I asked you before if you could just give us a minute or two on what you don't do. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Thank you. Why don't you give us a minute or two on what you're doing these days? Because I know you're doing a lot of things. Sure. Um, in, in my capacity for this uh, afternoon, um, I'm, I've been helping the Army with a, a, a community-based facilitation process for improving relationships between community um, and Army about Pohakuloa training area. I have a my own company, a consulting firm, Kalipi Enterprises, and then my full-time job is working in renewable energy for Progression Energy. And you're a lawyer, too. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about P Pohakaloa. I mean, it is a it is a beautiful area there. I used to go hiking up, uh, you know, in the in the Saddle Road. If you go in the south side of the Saddle Road and walk right up to the top of uh, Mauna Loa, mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful hikes in Hawaii, and, and up the top is uh, thirteen thousand two hundred and some some odd feet, and the um, and the outhouse there looks into the crater. It's the most fabulous outhouse in the world uh, with, with a view <laughs> that you cannot miss. <laughs> but um, that's not actually Pohakaloa. You have to go down into the saddle road and over to the, the north side um, and up the hill and there's Pohakaloa. And it's been there for a long time as an army training area. Um, it's still there. Um, it, has, uh, it has a history. Uh, Greg, can you talk about the history of Pohakaloa? Absolutely. It's a great summary, though, Jay. Uh, the garrison itself was established in 1956 uh, under the executive orders of then the territorial governor of, the, of Hawaii. Uh, it established the garrison, and the garrison was constructed using uh, leftover Korean War materials. And we did that using troop construction. Both uh, Army soldiers and Marines built the Quonset huts that if you drive by today, you can still see them. So they're going on 70-plus years old and uh, they're in need of replacement and repair. Uh, all total, we have uh, 133,000 acres uh, here at PTA that equates to about 210 square miles. Little known fact, uh, 210 square miles is the size of Guam. So Pohakaloa training area as it sits here in the Humaulu region, the Saddle region area, is uh, about the size of Guam. And you have a, a couple of uh, hundred uh, permanent staff up there. Uh, what, what, is, what kind of a job is it for them? What do they do? We do. Uh, we only have five military, five uniform military as part of the garrison. They're permanently stationed here. Uh, we get the work done, uh, the base support, through 230 uh, 
civilians, whether that's armed civilians uh, or full-time contractors and cooperators that sit here at PTA and support garrison operations. And those people uh, are generally from the community. So we're, we're part of the local communities here on the island. Uh, you know, while the military will train, change out about every two years, uh, the civilian workforce is, has been here. It's a permanent thing. They've been here for years uh, with a great deal of experience uh, and professionalism in supporting PTA. So <clears throat> you're training what? All branches of all services? Who are you, who are you training and, and in what way are you training them? Uh, we do. So uh, the folks that train at PTA are not just Army. We have other than Army or Marines, Air Force, some Navy and Special Forces come here to train. Uh, they do that here at PTA because at their home stations, uh, particularly on Oahu, they just don't have the uh, space and the ranges to fire the weapon systems that they have. They have to come here to PTA to fire the weapons uh, as if they were in combat to so the max range of the weapon systems, the max capacity. Um, just like with the uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft can fly on Oahu, but it lacks sufficient airspace to do what they need to do. It's just not enough of it on Oahu. So they come here and use the airspace above PTA uh, to do those maneuvers uh, with the MV-22 Ospreys and the helicopters that you'll see uh, as you drive by PTA. So Very, um, this is uh, infantry. Uh, is it um, uh, the Air National Guard involved, Coast Guard? Absolutely. Are they all involved in some way? Absolutely. And most importantly, the uh, Army National Guard and Army Air National Guard that uh, are from Hawaii, they come here to train. It's critically important that those young men and women learn how uh, to fire their weapon systems, qualify with their weapons. Uh, what they do here will save lives in combat. Uh, this is where they train and develop those skills uh, that they'll need later on. So it, it's important that we take care of those men and women before they deploy out elsewhere in the world. Sure. Uh, we, we, it, is, it is a wide variety of the branches, Jay. So we do have infantry, armor, aviation, uh, all branches. Engineers will come out here. The MPs are out here, military police. So it's, it's across all branches, all segments of the military. Are you a trainer? Uh, I'm in the capacity I am now, I'm the deputy garrison commander. So I'm really responsible for the civilians here working at the installation and supporting the commander and his objectives and goals uh, and supporting the units as they deploy to PTA. And it is a deployment from Oahu or elsewhere in the world, uh, and get, making sure they get what they need to get here, train safely and go home. So that's what the garrison does. It supports the training that's going on here. So uh, you have courses and classes and, and graduations and certificates and the like? No, it's, it's not like that at all. It's, it's really unit level training as well as some individuals. So soldiers or Marines will come out and qualify with their individual weapons at our ranges. And then they'll gradually move up into squad level or larger organizations for training together as teams. Uh, and they can get up to a company level operations on some of our ranges uh, and also involve different aspects of the military. So you might be an infantryman uh, that's uh, training with or alongside of artillerymen, firing their artillery on objectives uh, that are working with aviation or aircraft, both rotary wing or helicopters and fixed wing aircraft that'll fly over and, and drop ordnance. Uh, and they learn how to, to uh, use all of those in a concerted fashion to achieve a, an objective. So that's where this sort of combined arms training occurs is here at PTA. Well, let's turn to Noelani. Have you been up there, Noelani? Have you participated? Uh, have you, you know, walked the perimeter, so to speak, to see what's going on? Yes, I've been up there. Uh, I um, when back when I was a military legislative assistant for Senator Akaka, I was uh, was when I was first given the tours at uh, Pohakuloa. And then um, as a um, resident back here, you know, I, I've participated in, in some meetings on on the installation. Were you, where, when were you with uh, Senator Akaka? I, I saw that in your bio because I, I, I was in his office in 2000, 2001. You might have been there as a staffer. Were you there as a staffer then? Yeah, I staffed the meeting, Jay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I knew there was a certain magnetism between us. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I was there from 1999 to 2006. Yeah, perfect, perfect. We go back, don't we? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're just having a moment, if you don't mind, Greg. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> So no, Alani, what you know, what what is going on between the community and Pohakaloa? I mean, you you know, you suggest that maybe there was an issue, or there could be an issue, and uh, you're there to avoid an issue, or at least to improve relationships uh, to the extent you know, because it's not always, it's not always, you know, the the beautiful island of, of Big Island is beautiful, and yet there are controversies about so many things. It would not surprise me a lot to find that those controversies included Pohakaloa. Has it ever happened? Well, definitely. Um, I think uh, there's always been longstanding issues um, for a number of things on the Big Island. And my involvement goes back, like I said, when I was um, working with Senator Akaka's office in D.C., I was the legislative staffer who handled both the Native Hawaiian issues as well as the military issues. Um, so I often had an opportunity to um, bridge the gap, if you would say, and speak to uh, people on all sides of the many issues and concerns that were there. My involvement now is via the Military Affairs uh, Council for the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii. For a number of years, we were talking about um, notwithstanding the number of issues that just have been ongoing, how, how can we create a process for a community to just have talk story sessions with the army um, on a, you know, outside of a regulatory process, outside of a permitting office, really to build relationship and just to have the time to ask the questions that you never get to ask and to have the dialogue that you never get to have when each participant is only given three minutes in a, you know, in a session, as an example. So really, that's what we have spent the last few years coming together and trying to figure out how to do. So I've been fortunate to be a part of a large number of people working to put that together. You know, it's very important. It's, it's not only important on the Big Island. Uh, not only important, uh, you know, between the people in the Big Island and the people at uh, Pohakaloa, it's important in the country that people appreciate that, yes, we do have a military. Yes, we have a federal government. Yes, we should know them. They are us. We are them. We're all together in this country. Um, and I think that's what you're doing. I mean, and that's what we're doing here on ThinkTech, you know, to try to uh, talk to the military and make people understand that, um, you know, they're part of us and we're part of them. Uh, so they should know what's going on. Yeah. So what is going on in terms of the community and uh, and the army at Pohakalo and all the all the training? Uh, you have you have meetings, you have gatherings. I saw you had a big, may I say, party <laughs> this spring. What was that like? Um, well, we didn't necessarily have a party in what we were doing. We um, we had to do everything virtually because uh, a virtual party. Right, right. And so we actually kicked off something called the Kahoa Hoa process, which is a community driven process. And we spent the first six weeks meeting only about how are we going to talk story together? What is the process? What do we share in terms of values? And what are our agreements? We all acknowledge that there are some issues that can be resolved relatively quickly. And then there are some issues that will take a very long time, right? And there are some issues that we're super mad about and some issues that we're like, ah, okay, right? And so understanding that range and understanding the many people who could be a part of it, what do we share in terms of values and being there and what are our agreements so the first six weeks were just about how do we engage as humans together right and then we moved into a stage of let's start talking about some of the issues and let's use the agreements we came up with so um that's what we've been doing it's super early in the process and i'd say we're we're having the space to have some pretty good dialogue um, between military members and people within the community, all aspects, whether it's business, whether it's cultural practitioners, you know, whether it's people who are just curious, educators, et cetera. Uh, you're kind of a facilitator then. Am I yes, right? I'm okay. facilitating, a, a team of us are facilitating, yes. <laughs> you know, it's not too far from TMT, now that I think about it, it's, a, it's across the way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, is there a parallel there of any kind? I think in general, there's a parallel throughout our country, as you as you indicated, right? Um, I think there's a, a, a lot of polarization period that's happening and we're becoming conditioned to having to pick sides. What the work that we're doing is trying to create that space that says, okay, you can have your positions, 
but let's be curious. Let's hold our positions. Nobody's nobody's making us change our T-shirt color, but let's let's find out what the deal is. Let's let's actually begin to talk and let's see if we can find some commonality and let's agree to disagree. But let's figure out: Are there anything? Are there things we can agree upon together as we build relationship and then kind of scaffold that approach, right? As we build our trust, as we demonstrate to each other that we're not going to slap each other down when nobody's looking, right? Um, how do we move together, right? And, and a lot of the commonality is um, the love that Hawaii Island people have for this island, for our Aina, for each other, for our family. We live on an island, we're all related to each other, right? So how do we acknowledge that and figure out how we move forward together? And that's really what this is about. So it, it, it was not really a party at all, was it? It, <laughs> no. was, a, it, it was an engagement. It was a, a connection, so to speak. And, and would you say it was successful? Would you say that it, at the end, uh, you know, people were more akamai about, about the together of it uh, than they were at the beginning? I think we have a lot of people who are pleasantly surprised at um, the level of discussion that we're currently engaging in, right? But we're still only at the beginning. Like if this were kindergarten to, you know, senior year in high school, we're still in first grade, right? We're still just uh, <laughs> feeling each other out, figuring out, you know, when we get to talk and and all of that. So I'd say people are pleasantly surprised um, in the amount of sharing, in the amount of space that's been given for the diversity of opinion, um, you know. So so that part has been good. Yeah, great. So how does this look from your end of it, Greg? I mean, um, the, you know, I mean, would you prefer to be left alone? Would you prefer not to engage with the, you know, the sort of the cultural aspects of the Big Island and just, you know, go do your army and military training thing? Uh, why do this? And how well does it work on your side of it? Well, well, thanks for asking. Uh, we are engaged already. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate all the efforts that Noe and her group has done. I, I totally appreciate getting to know each other. I think here on this island, things work out in a very personal way and understanding uh, who you're speaking with and understanding others out there. It, it goes a long way to resolving differences and uh, uh, approaches to, to problem sets. Um, when I say that we're already involved, that we are. We want to be good stewards of the environment. And we strive to do that. We have uh, a great investment in both our cultural resources program and our natural resources program. We spend roughly three to five million dollars annually on those two programs. We manage 26 threatened endangered species uh, here at PTA. Uh, there are six animal species that we manage and 20 plant species. Some of those plants are only found here on the island of Hawaii and one was thought to be previously extinct. And we go through a conservation process to manage those, to protect them as we continue our training. Uh, however, uh, you know, we're, we're very conscientious about doing that, uh, but not in a way that would stop the training that we want to get done. Uh, we also manage approximately 1,200 different historic sites that we look at and, uh, throughout PTA. So we're already involved in that. Uh, we want to be good members of the community. We live in the community. The folks that I mentioned previously, uh, they live on all sides of the island uh, and they're out in the communities and they're part of the community. So we want to work things out. And uh, the things that we talked about with Noe and her group, uh, we want to come to a, a solution set. Uh, yeah, the well, you're out there. <laughs> More than ever, you know, <clears throat> the military are diplomats. They're not only diplomats here. They're diplomats everywhere, and um, I hope in the future that becomes more and more the case. To fully understand the world as it is, you have to be a diplomat. Noe is certainly a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, you know, if I asked you, know, Alani, what, you know, what, what do you want from Pohakaloa? What do you want from them? Why do you spend the time talking to them? Uh, what's your, you know, your, your goal, your purpose in, in facilitating these discussions? I think um, it's it's to shift the model. Um, instead of it 
uh, instead of discussions only being when there's a regulatory action, if, if Pwakaloa is to be a part of the community, let's really engage um, as community and let's put that in the hands of the community. There's a lot of uh, changeover that happens when military leaders move in and out and community still talking about something and it becomes the third commander that you have to explain this to, right? Same thing with, with community members moving in and out. If we can have some continuity, that would really go a long way. Again, it's the bridging of the gap, right? It's, it's creating a space to be able to have these sometimes difficult conversations and to know it's okay, it's not threatening, right? Because then Jay, I think that in addition to Pohokuloa, you know, there are many other issues that we can talk about, but if we can empower community to work with government, to work with entities, um, we can find the pathway to move forward. Yeah, especially now. You know, I think a lot of people walk around in the state of Hawaii and they say, hmm, you know, we, we could have a bad storm. We could have extreme weather and don't worry because the military is here and they'll take care of us. Other people say, no, they got their own mission. <laughs> They're going to do their own mission first. But the answer is it's both missions. And, it, you know, it would be a very, a very important contribution to the community uh, when, when there is an extreme situation and, and the you know <clears throat> the navy the united states navy came to pearl harbor in guess what year 1850 they were there with a harbor with pearl the, the the predecessor of pearl harbor today in 1850 they are as much a part of the culture of hawaii you know the economic development of hawaii you know the the matrix of hawaii if you will as anybody i mean you know they've been here and um, so it's the same. It's the same here. I think sometimes we forget that. And then there were events, you know, like the Massey case back in the 30s. Right. That didn't help. Um, right. and, and I and I suppose uh, all the military that was assigned here in World War Two, that might not have helped either because it did. It, it put a certain stress on the community at the time. Um, so now the mission is to keep them together. And I think it's very worthy. And the question. You know, one thing that Noelani mentioned that I think is worth asking you about, Greg, you know, the problem is that the military comes and goes. Everybody is on a rotation. Everybody soon enough is out of here. And so you don't have that kind of continuity where people are laying down personal roots. They're always on the move in and out. How do you, what do you answer to that? How do you, you know, how, how can you deal with the fact that it's a, it's a rotation? It's, a, it's musical people. Just acknowledge that. Uh, that is the life of the military. I was part of that. No, he was part of it. Uh, you have to rotate from one unit to the next. However, what you have just below that, uh, the level of the military, the civilian staff that I mentioned. Uh, I mentioned only five military uniform folks here at PTA. The rest uh, are all civilians, and I'm the senior civilian here. The continuity between the command teams that uh, rotate through. And those are the folks that have roots here, that have continuity from one commander to the next over time and can make sure that the programs that we've initiated from one commander carry on through to the next. So that's the, it's the civilian leadership that's, that remains. Yeah, that that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. The other thing is that, you know, you occupy a lot of, a lot of land, as uh, what you said. As a matter of fact, the federal enclave in that area goes down to uh, what KMC, uh, Kilauea Military Camp. Do you get to spend time there? It's beautiful there. It's just still, it's just still as luscious as it used to be. No, you get there too. It's really nice. Oak Club, fabulous. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's the only bowling alley uh, on the east side of the island. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but you know that there's a lot of land, and um, then at the same time, you know, you have you have alternative uses of the land uh, for energy, and and uh, there's a fellow named Don Thomas works uh, in So West at the university who discovered water up way up there, not too far from Pohakaloa, water in, in Mauna Kea, inside the mountain. And you know, one of these days we may have to tap into that. Um, it's another aquifer, a, an elevated aquifer. It's quite remarkable and good for him for finding it. But you know, if that happens and other people want that land, um, what happens to the, you know, the, the federal enclave, Greg? You think it's at risk over time? I can't speak to over time as to what will happen to the, the, the federal enclave, the property, but I do know Dr. Don Thomas very well, 
And oh, by the way, he found that water drilling here on PTH, it's a couple hundred feet from my office right now. Fabulous. Uh, funded, by, funded by the Army. So we saw the efficacy of what Don Thomas was doing at the high level water near Hilo in the wells there and uh, followed his sort of theory on water being captured up here in the Huma Ula region. We funded that. Yes, there is water here and it's, it's good, clean water. It's about 10,000 years old. So some issues that go along with that. Um, and I, I agree. understand it makes a better martini when it's anything over 5,000 years old makes a better martini. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, for the Army's perspective, we want to be engaged with the local communities. We want to uh, uh, give back. So, you know, we wouldn't see it as being or owning the water necessarily solely for the Army use. That would be a shared, a shared use by the community. I know there's some thoughts on that by senior leaders about if we were to drill a well and have the water made available, uh, that would go out to local communities as well. I mean, that's sort of the technology we would use to do that, how we got there, and then the water itself. So that's out there. But also, and I want to make a point of the engagement. You talked about the, the number of pieces of land here on the island of Hawaii. Kilauea Military Camp, yes, great facility. Uh, take, take, uh, take advantage of that and use, use the facility there. In Kauai High Harbor, you mentioned the harbor there, and that's how we bring in all the equipment uh, from units deploying. But for outreach to the community, we have a, a really good hunting program, and uh, we allow folks to come on to our lands, hunt, and there's an active hunting community here on the island. So they'll come out and use bow and arrows against the mammals. And then uh, also, right now, we've got the, uh, the turkey season going on, and there's some, some uh, use of shotguns for turkeys and things like that. So uh, we open that up to the public and to the hunting community. So we bring those folks in here to the, uh, on the installation to do that. Yeah, you, you mentioned turkey season. Some people feel that we have a turkey season going on in Washington too. <laughs> and uh, I, I just wonder, uh, you know, we, we spoke briefly before the show began. And I wonder if you could uh, comment on my, my comment, my concern. Um, about the, um, you know, the army and the role it plays under the constitution and under the rules of the rules of the army, you know, the traditions, uh, the, the patriotic and constitutional, um, you know, conditions of the army in these difficult times. Sure. And we spoke about, you know, the change in leadership, uh, change in administration in Washington, DC and the goings on there. Now, I think, uh, the military, always, always uh, understand that they take an oath to defend and support the Constitution of the United States, not any one individual. And it's, it doesn't matter that there's a change of leadership going on, change of administration in Washington, D.C. It's the fact that we still support and defend the Constitution. And so that's, that's a perspective that all members of the, the armed services come from. Um, and so that, that really what's going on there does not affect what we do here to train. Uh, we, we have a responsibility to train those young men and women I talked about previously, particularly those from the state of Hawaii, uh, to be the most proficient they can in their craft. So when they are deployed and put in harm's way, uh, they can come back to us uh, whole. And uh, that's really why we're here. How do you feel? I mean, I, different people would answer this differently, but how do you feel about the, uh, the quality and capability of the, of the uh, American military force in today's world, where other countries are trying real hard to build competitive forces. Uh, it, it has been for years, and, it, and it, I think it truly is the best uh, professional military force in the world, without question. Uh, you know, I've seen it, it's probably at its lowest point in the late 70s, just after Vietnam, and there were issues inside the military and our formations that has long since gone away. We have some of the most educated young people, some soldiers uh, out there and uh, I'm very very proud of what they do uh, here and abroad and I think uh, it just it's a testimony to everyone all, all across the formations and all services that uh, we have the best military without question. That's great yes I totally agree. So Noe uh, are you ready to uh, you know have another career maybe as a JAG officer? I, th I can put you in touch with Greg if you like. She's got a job. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, no, what do you see as the future of all this? I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's part of our history. It's certainly part of the history of the Big Island. 
It's a lot of land, a lot of activity. Uh, and it does, it does need connection with the people around in the island. Everyone in the island should know and have a kind of affinity for this particular, you know, location. It's, it's beautiful and it's also magnetic in its own way. It has a history. So the question is, uh, you know, over time, do you see, what do you see in the future? Do you see people who will covet this land, people who will find this land sacred, people who will want this land for other purposes? Do you see that? What, what do you see in the future in terms of the relationship of the state, um, the Big Island and Pohakaloa? Well, I think there's a lot of people who see the land as sacred now. Right, and who have special affinity to that land, whether they're military members who have survived contingency situations because of their training there and they feel like, but for the mana that they had from when they were training and what they learned, you know, they wouldn't be walking around today, um, to the cultural practitioners who see um, that area as as a source, you know, as and as a special place. I mean, there's 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 a lot of affinity for that. I think the key thing is Pokolo is a, a microcosm, right, of of many parts of what we're talking about, given the um, longstanding issues resulting from the overthrow, um, given some of a lot of the things we have to address as we move forward as a state. You know, Senator Akaka uh, talked about the reconciliation process. That was a big part of the apology resolution um, and and bringing people together. And this it, this is a continuation, you know, of of that idea and that concept of being able to discuss. Um, of being able to share information. I think human nature, um, lots of psycho psychological reports will talk about the fact that when there's an absence or a vacuum of information, humans tend to think the worst, right? So as long as there's not information going both ways, we're going to act based on the assumptions, based on our uh, of what we believe, not necessarily based on the facts. If we can begin to share that information, it becomes that much more important so that we're moving forward, right? And, I, and that's what I really see as the future, Jay. I mean, we can either stay in our silos and, um, and, and move on what we believe without actually engaging, or we can begin to engage and figure things out as we move forward. Everybody has a special affinity for every part of the island. Um, and for part of our state. And we all feel uh, a large kuleana for what the future looks like uh, for future generations. Just, just, just hold the road down. You, you know, the saddle road was improved a few years ago. Uh, there's no need to make it a six lane highway, all right? <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're almost out of time. In fact, we are out of time. And I want to ask you guys for um, final comments messages that you'd like to leave with our viewers, um, um, you know, uh, little pearls of wisdom or big ones would be appropriate. Greg, you first. Uh, I just want to let you know that everyone up here that works here, that trains here, we are part of the local communities. And we do have work that's ongoing to renovate those Quonset huts. So we do bring in uh, folks to work our contracts. We have one going on right now for 15 plus million dollars to take down the first two rows of Quonsets. In the past five years since I've been here, we've put in at least $74 million worth of projects. We're going to continue to do so as, they, as we modernize facilities and improve the throughput or the capacity of our ranges. It's a great thing to see that we have folks here on the island coming up and making their livelihoods at uh, PTA and then going back home. Um, we really, really uh, uh, see that as a positive thing. And also... Uh, we do reach out. We have a mutual aid agreement between our our uh, our police, PTA, or excuse me, fire, PTA, fire and emergency services. They are responsible for responding to any accident or incident along uh, Saddle Road, uh, Daniel K. Inouye Highway, and they're responsible for responding to anything between the top of Mauna Kea and the top of Mauna Loa. They cover 420 square miles of response areas. Uh, so if you have an accident or have an incident in that area, it's going to be uh, PTA Army Fire and Emergency Services that are going to respond. So I need to let folks know that, that we are part of the community. We're reaching outside the fence line. And we want to encourage and, and through the process that NOE has, work those relationships and come to some mutual and agreed upon solutions. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Greg. And NOE, could you give us your thoughts that you would like to leave with us? Pearls of wisdom will be accepted. 
<laughs> I wish I had those. <laughs> um, but in general, it's just that community can be empowered. We can have discussions. We can hold the space. And so often um, we, we're taught that you have to choose a side. And while it's important to have your beliefs and know, you can use curiosity. You can engage in discussions. And um, I think there's a big future forward for everyone uh, through collaboration. Here and everywhere in the country. We have to come back together again. Right. That's what you guys are saying. Right. So really appreciate your, your efforts in that regard, both sides of the coin. And it's great what you're doing. Thank you, Noelani. Thank you, Greg. Thank I hope you. we can do okay. this show again. Aloha.